As Neil explained, normally we're teaching verse by verse through a book of the Bible. But through this series, it's more of a practical look at how to have new life in Jesus Christ. So my message today is going to be a lot different than what I would normally teach on a Sunday morning. In fact, it's almost difficult for me to do because I'm such a verse-by-verse expositor of Scripture. But I want to start with this story. A very successful businessman was trying to transition his business. Technology, as it has a lot of people, impacted him, and he had to pivot, he had to change. And so he was hosting a giant dinner for all his employees, his associates, his investors, and he wanted to unveil the new strategy. He wanted them to know how important they were and how they were a big part of the success of the organization in the past. So he is home in a home office, working on his presentation, working on his speech, and his wife came to him and said, I've got to run some errands. Will you watch our son for a couple of hours? Well, reluctantly, he said yes, because he knew he needed to focus. And he had about 10 minutes before his son came to the door and said those infamous words that you hear from seven and eight-year-olds, I'm bored, Dad. So he tried to entertain him, and he finally came up with a plan. He found a National Geographic magazine, opened it up, and there was a two-page picture of a map of the world. So he took it carefully out, cut it up into pieces, and said, son, If you can take this scotch tape and tape the world back the way it's supposed to be, I'll give you that $20 you want for that gift, that toy you've been hassling me about for months. The kid said, you're on. And so he thought, well, this is going to buy me two or three hours at least, right? I mean, how many of us could put the whole world back together in little bitty pieces from a magazine? So he's back in his office. He's going over his notes. And in 10 minutes, his son shows up. The whole world's completely done. He's like, what? How in the world did you do that? And he said, well, as I was putting it back together, I I turned it over, and there was a picture of a man advertising a leather jacket. And he said, I figured, you know, that if I got the man right, I get the world right. And the, the dad said to himself, you know what? That's going to be the topic of my message. If you can get the man right or the woman right, you can get the world right. And that's what I want to talk about today. If you can get the man or the woman right with the Lord, then you can change your world. And really you can. New life in Christ gets the man or woman's heart right. You know, Jesus said in John chapter 10, the thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and destroy. And he does it, listen, he does it through lies. He does it through deception. Jesus, who is the way and the truth, says, I've come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. I'm the good shepherd, and the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. And when you come to Christ, my life verse is 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Transformed people. Life in Jesus. Transforming people one at a time is really, I believe, the heart of God for our world. Uh, It always has amazed me, you know, God, who's all-powerful, who's all-great, who's all-omnipotent, when He started to create the world and He decided to make mankind, He made them one at a time. There was Adam, then there was Eve. When God wanted to make a nation that He would shine His light through for the whole world, He picked one man. He picked Abraham. He started with one family. God works on individual hearts 
and he calls people individually. And every person has to make their own choice, their own decision, and allow the Lord to transform them. And here's what happens. Listen. When a person individually comes to Christ and their life or heart is transformed, it changes their marriage. It changes their family. You know, I grew up in a family, and now I have three kids, and now my three kids have families. But I can tell you this, the family I grew up in is nothing like the family my kids grew up in because I had a transformed life. My kids grew up in the church, going to missions, doing all things about the Lord. I I think I hardly ever attended church growing up. A transformed heart changes marriages, it changes families, it, it changes communities, it changes businesses, it changes schools, it changes nations. God is about transforming lives. That's what he's all about. If you get the man or if you get the woman right, you can get the world right. One person at a time. You can get the church right. You can get your life right if you allow Jesus Christ to lead you and guide you. And and please listen. I I want you to hear this part. It's God who does, does the transformation, but only if you and I will cooperate with God's grace, God's desire, God's truth and purpose for your life. I always told my kids, you've heard me say this a million times as they were growing up, I I drilled this into their minds and hearts. God has a plan for your life, but so does the enemy. And you will choose day by day whose plan you will fulfill. God has a plan, and so does the enemy. And from the very beginning of time, If you go back to the garden, you see the enemy had a plan, and it came through a lie. It came through a scheme to keep you and I from experiencing all that God had for mankind. The enemy came. You remember the garden, the serpent, the tree, the fruit. The enemy slithers in and says, you know, I don't believe that, you know, what God said is totally right, and I'm not sure you can believe it, because if you go ahead and do what you really want to do, what looks good to you, which, which will make you wise, you'll not surely die. You'll, it'll not happen like God said. God gave man a choice. God gave man freedom. God gave man consequences for his actions. And God gave man truth. The serpent came with his plan, with his choice, with his truth, so to speak. And our culture, our world, has believed a lie from that time on. And I want you to to listen. Think about this. Do you like to be lied to? Has anyone ever lied to you and you're like, you find out later and say, oh, gosh, he lied to me. She lied to me. Of course, none of you have experienced this. My kids, they lied to me. <laughs> no one likes it. I mean, universally, you can go anywhere and, and, and you say, do you like to be lied to? No. But here is one of the prominent lies of our culture, uh, the modern secular world, is that there is no universal truth. We just found out there is. No one likes to be lied to. You'll hear this mantra sort of in our culture, nothing's true for everyone. Everyone has to find their own truth. Everyone has to embrace their own, you know, self and what works for them. And, and, and you'll hear stuff like, well, that Jesus stuff may work for you, but not for me. And the infamous words of Trump, wrong. <laughs> it, it is wrong. <laughs> That was bad, wasn't it? I'm not going to do that again. (laughs) I didn't do that first service, just so you know. (laughs) The truth in the Bible, that that heaven and hell stuff, you know, it it might be good for you, but it's not for me. Well, it's it's a lie. It's the enemy's lie. 
That stuff about sex outside of marriage and, and you know, I need to explore my, you know, sexual. No, that, that's a lie. It's a lie of the enemy. God created it for something totally different. This male and female created he them, and he knew me while I was in the womb. Come on. No, it's true. It's real. Well, I was born this way. Yeah, you were. We all were. We were all born sinners. But you're not born again that way, and you can change. And God does bring about transformation of life through Christ. See, the the philosophy and mindset of the world is, well, I just want to be happy. I just want my kids to be happy. I just want them to, you know, be fulfilled. And the way you're happy, the culture says, is you find your truth. Find what works for you. And get more of what you want. And and find out what makes you happy. Here, just take it and eat it. You'll be fulfilled. All that other stuff, don't worry about it. And most of us know it's a lie. The pleasure, the money, the possessions, the success, the power, the fame. Oh, that's a very seductive fruit. Well, if you could just get that. And a lot of people get it. And they find out, I'm bored. It didn't fulfill me. And then the other side of the sword is some people never taste it. And they think, well, that's why I'm not happy. Well, if I had the money, if I had her, if I had him, if I had the house, if I had the boat, I would be happy. So they feel like, well, I can't be happy because I can't get it. And other people get it and say, well, I'm still not happy because it's a lie. That's not what we're created for. Like Adam and Eve, we trade truth for something totally different than what God had planned. God's truth transforms our lives. Listen, it transforms our thoughts. It transforms our words, and it transforms our actions. It renews our mind and causes the things that are in our heart to be different when the words come out, and it causes us to live in a way that is totally different than before we were transformed or saved by Him. We cannot, any of us, control our circumstances. I mean, look at COVID. We can't control it. We can't even understand it hardly. There's so many different ways people are coming at it. We, we don't have any control over our circumstances. We, we, we can't control this surge of, of racism and riots. I mean, where, wh- how did this happen again? Can't control it. Can't control this crazy election and this division. I, I watched the, the, was it a debate? <laughs> I, I watched that the other night, and I, I was so restless afterwards. I could hardly go to sleep. I thought, gosh, this is not good what's going on. We can't control the election and the division. We, we can't control technology. It's constantly changing, and some of it's extremely annoying, right? I mean, I don't have an Apple Watch. I have an iPhone, but I don't have the watch because I don't want it going off all the time telling me to listen to this message and return this call, and, and, and it's like, I don't, I, there's a place where I, I, I didn't want it looking at me all the time. We, 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 we are overwhelmed by, you know, we can't even control church. Pastors change. What is up with that? (laughs) We can't even control bridges. Barges are drifting all over the place. Jobs are lost, stock market. I mean, I, I, I looked at the phone yesterday. I keep a little track of the stock market. President Trump's in the hospital. Stock market goes down. Really? There's a secret saying, listen, there's a secret saying among pastors that goes like this, and I'm going to tell you it, but don't tell any pastor that I told you this. (laughs) Pastors preach sermons that they need to hear, and this is a sermon I need to hear, but I also believe it's a sermon you need to hear, and I want to talk about some of the basic principles of walking out a transformed life, what it means to continue to be transformed. And here's a few things, these are practical things, not my normal type of Bible teaching, but here's a few things I need to hear. 
If I will surrender to the truth of the Scripture and take time to put it in my life, it will transform me. Number two, getting what I want materially doesn't make me fulfilled. It's true. Too much of what I want is usually dependent on unsustainable circumstances or situations that don't last. When I'm grateful and thankful, I am a lot more content. Life is better when I'm being myself, not when I'm pretending to be someone else to impress you. A surrendered believer transformed by Christ is contagious. A surrendered believer transformed by Christ is contagious. The more I serve Him and others, the more I serve Him and others, the more fulfilled I truly am. These are truths. Let me give you some questions that rattle around in my life, in my heart, at this time in my life, at this season in my life. They, they, they help me focus about what lies ahead, and you need to. There's four of them. Who am I? What am I here for? What matters most to me? And what matters least? I think those are four important questions for you and I to grapple with as we think about being transformed into a new creature by Christ. Who am I? What am I here for? What matters most? And what matters least? I answer the who am I by going to the truth of Scripture. And I say, I'm accepted. I'm God's child. You know, I'm going to go beyond that. I'm God's friend. I'm forgiven. I, I'm a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I have been bought with a price. I'm not my own. I belong to Him. I'm a member of the body of Christ. I have a great big family all over the world. I'm not alone. I'm chosen and I'm adopted. You know, my youngest son, Ryan, adopted a little boy, Levi, whose mother was a meth addict, and he has some, he, little, little Levi has some issues. We love him. Now, you have a baby, I have a baby, we have a child, you're stuck with them, right? Even if they're ugly, like, you know, oh, the baby's so pretty, oh, not so much. <laughs> but you adopt a child, that's a different story. They're chosen by you. They're, not only are we born into God's kingdom, but he says we're adopted. He chose us. I'm complete in him, the Scripture says. I have direct access to the throne of grace in my time of need. All of us do if you're a Christian. I am free from condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus said, I've come into the world to save the world, not to condemn it. And I know that God works for good in all my circumstances that I can't control. God, I don't know what's going on. Can't even have an Easter service. But Lord, you're in control. You're going to work it all together for the good. And nothing can separate me or you if you're a believer here from the love of God. That's who I am. I have confidence that God will finish the work that He has begun. That's powerful stuff. I'm a citizen of heaven. I've not been given the spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. That's who you are. That's who I am. I've called, I'm chosen uh, to bear fruit for God Almighty and the kingdom of God. And that's just a tip if you will, the proverbial iceberg of who you are, who I am in Christ. God's like the, like the eternal flame. And He says to you and I, you need to be 
someone who helps transform lives. We're going to turn the lights out for just a second. This is who we are. We're the light of the world. And light dispels darkness. And wherever you go, where he's planted you in this neighborhood, at this job, at this, at this uh, school, or wherever you go, you are a light whether you know it or not, and God has equipped you to help transform other lives. Not with a big lighter, but with his love, his truth, and his grace. So God invites you. He invites me to trust and surrender to Him and to His truth, not to believe the lie of the culture or of the enemy, but to keep hearing and experiencing the beauty and the impact of the life God invites you and I to live. Just come unto me. All you who are weary and are heavy laden from all this junk you're trying to find life in. God has truth. God has a plan. You have a choice. You have freedom. To believe the lie or to believe the truth. The enemy's plan is to to kill, steal, and destroy. And and how do I fulfill his purpose and his plan? I want to give you two things that I found in my life. Here's a guy who's been pastoring a church for 37 years. And how do you stay connected? How do you stay alive? How do you stay excited? How how do you, you know, stay in his plan and continue to be transformed? How do you keep moving forward and not become someone who sits on the bench? Because a lot of people just sit on the bench. How do you stay in the game, so to speak? What matters most? Well, number one, I would say for me, and I think it's true for all of us as believers, keep serving the Lord. Don't stop. Well, I'm 65 now. I'm retired. No, you're not. You're you're part of the Lord's family. You're part of his mission. Keep serving the Lord with the gospel, with kindness, with with patience, with courage, with thoughtfulness, with forgiveness, with care. Keep, Keep living the Christian life and serving Him. Start each day with a prayer, a prayer of gratitude. Lord, I'm grateful, I'm thankful. And with a prayer of surrender. Go out of your way to do something for your friends, your family, your neighbor, your spouse. Keep serving. Several months ago, I decided to start doing something for my my spouse every day. I haven't done it every day, (laughs) in case you talk to Lynn. But I'm trying to do it as often as I can. My wife's an early riser. If we had cows, she'd be milking them early in the morning. That's how early she gets up. Early for me is 6 a.m. That tells you how early she gets up. So by the time I get up, 6.30 or so, she's been up. So I decided, well, what can I do for Lynn? It's a simple thing. It's not a, it's not a massive thing. And none of you men have to do this. And I'm not saying, wives, you should ask your husband to do this. But if he loves you, no, I'm not going to (laughs) say. You might think it's weird. I don't think I'll tell you. No, I'll tell you. Here it is. I make the bed every single morning. And I'm kind of a, I know, come on. (laughs) So every single morning, and I can make the bed really well. But, hey, I do it, and I don't say anything about it except when I'm in church and everybody's listening. (laughs) But hey, you know, go out of your way, do something for your friends, your family, your neighbor, your spouse. Keep serving. Here's something else. Everybody should have at least one person in their life that you're praying for. Pray for someone. Pray for them. 
Don't just, oh, Lord, it's me, it's me. Pray for somebody else. Encourage someone. And here's another one. These are just practical guidelines to live a transformed life. Be patient with that person who drives you crazy. You know who you're thinking about. (laughs) Be patient with that person. God loves them. Give somebody something that will help change them. Maybe it's money. Maybe it's a book. Whatever it might be. Maybe it's just a pat on the back. And once a month, or even more if you can do it, Tell someone your story. You have a story of transformation if you're walking with the Lord. Tell somebody about it. Keep that story alive in your heart and your mind. Uh, Even if you have to tell your dog the story once in a while. You like hearing it. Yeah, I was this, and the dog's looking at you, and then I was that, and you hang with me, you get this, you know, you just, whatever. Tell someone your story. It's powerful. It's your story. Here's a simple one. Eat something healthy once in a while. And here's the big one. Tell God often that you love Him and you trust Him. Just as much as you can. God, I love you and I trust you for all that's going down in my world. And be open to being used. And number two. Expose yourself to the truth, the Scriptures, and let it change you because it has the power to do that. See, here's the thing. Christians believe the Bible is the inspired Word of God, but they don't read it. People believe, oh, yeah, verse by verse, word by it's the inspired, anointed Word of God, but I don't read it. Why? Why? Well, I don't know where to start, and I'm not sure I understand it, and and I'm too busy, and I might interpret it wrongly. Okay. Or it requires so much time and so much patience. See, let me have your attention. Reading the Bible is like meeting a fascinating person. It takes time to get to know him or her. It just does. The Bible's the same way. It takes time to get to know it. The Bible's not a self-help book. It's not like you open it up and go, oh, it's got these great little quips and quotes and like fortune cookie. I'll open it up and go, oh, yeah. No, that's not the Bible. Of all the years I've had the privilege and honor of studying and reading the Bible, I think I've come to the terms that there's, there's, there's basically two things that I know about the Bible. The Bible is about God's heart. And the Bible's about your heart. And if you can get to know it, you get to know His heart, and you know how desperately you need His heart to change your heart. And the power of the Scripture will transform your life. It takes patience. It takes time. And we don't want to take the time because we're all impatient. We just are. We live in the most impatient culture I've ever seen. It's crazy. But I think the real reason that most people don't read the Bible, this is the last one, is we know that God's Word has the power to transform and change us, and most of us, if we're honest, we don't want to change. I'm pretty comfortable where I am. Uh, don't tell me about this issue in my life, and I don't want to read the Bible about that. And You know, if I have to change, man, that, 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 that takes time, that takes self-denial, that takes availability. Yeah, it does. But God wants to change you. I, I love Psalm 1. It's one of my favorite passages in the Scripture. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Here, take this. It'll make you happy. Who, who, who doesn't stand in the path of sinners or sit in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And that was the Scriptures in that day. He delights in that. That's where he finds his, his source. And he meditates day and night. He'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its seasons, whose leaf also should not wither. And whatever he does shall prosper. The truth of God's Word. And you get planted in that, it'll transform your life. It takes time, 
Yeah, it takes self-denial. It takes availability. I mean, let's say God wants to use your life. He does. And let's say God ran an ad looking for someone's life to be used by God. Submit a resume. What would you put on your resume? Dear God, love to work for you. I'm humble. Oh, you just disqualified yourself because you know you're not humble. I'm, I, I have a degree in theology. I like people. I, I planted a church. You know, you read the Bible, the Gospels, the New Testament, the Old Testament. Isn't it amazing the people that God uses? God used some fishermen who lived down in the Galilee. They weren't the scholars and the Bible teachers and the, you know, the religious leaders of Jerusalem. He would take a, a shepherd and turn him into a king, the, the most least likely one of the tribe. Take a little boy's lunch and feed thousands of people. He, he took a gathering demoniac, if you know the story, when he said, let's go over to the other side. And everybody else said, I'm not sure we want to go over there to those people. He took that gathering demoniac, and if you know the, the, the timeline, he was truly the first missionary that Jesus ever sent out. He said, let me go with you, Jesus. Jesus said, no, no, no. You stay here and tell the people in your own town what great things God has done for you. God's resume looks a little different for positions. He doesn't seem to go after the, the mighty and the wealthy and the powerful. We just bring what we have and who we are to God, and he says, I'll take care of the rest. But you've got to be available. God looks for available people. If you were to take out a piece of paper and a pen and, and say, okay, I'm going to be available to God, how, how, how much can you be available? Well, let's see, God, I'll 20% of my time. Hmm. No, God, I'm going to go further. I'm going to give you uh, 50%. I, oh, okay. No, God, I'll give you 80. Okay, God, I'm going to give you 100% of me. I'm available, 100%. What are you, what am I unwilling to give up for God? Well, I can't give that up. You know, that's my little thing, and... The world would say, oh, you tried this before, it didn't work. It's a lie. When God gets involved, if you make yourself available, if you'll put yourself in the truth, if you'll say, Lord, I'm available to serve, God shows up in a big way. Because God's plan is to use your life. Maybe you could pray this, Lord, here I am. I trust you with my life and with your plan. Everything on the table, Lord. Take what you want. Give what you want. I make myself 100% available to you. Give me new life. Transform my life. God, fill me with your spirit. Lead me. Challenge me. Encourage me. Open my eyes to all your possibilities. Show me, Lord, and I'll do it. See, here's the thing. If you can get the man or the woman right, you can get the world right, your world, the world you live in, the, the world that you walk through with all the you know, circumstances you can't control, with all the things that are happening around us, with your kids, with your marriage, with your family, with your addictions, with all the things. If God can get your heart right and consistently pour truth into it, well, he can get the man right. Are the woman right? If he can get the man or the woman right, he can get the marriage right, he can get the family right, he can get the school right. Because that's what God does, he makes things right. God transforms lives through his son Jesus Christ. If anyone be in Christ, not if uh, some of them, few of them, no, if, if anyone be in Christ, he or she is a new creature. Old things pass away, and behold, all things become new. How available are you to the Lord? He wants to use your life. Doesn't matter how young 
or how old. He wants to trans and he wants to continue to transform you from the day you come to Jesus Christ all the way to heaven. Because I would say to you, God's not finished with any of us yet. He's got a plan for your life. And so does the enemy. And the enemy comes to rob, to kill, and to destroy. Everything that God wants to give you. Think back to the garden. Here we're Adam and Eve. I mean, what a cool life. Can you imagine? They're living in paradise. They got their name and animals. They're, and they're both naked. How cool is that? I mean, that's amazing stuff. And they're un- easy, easy. And they're unashamed. And the enemy comes in and steals all the innocence from their life. And that's his job. God has a plan. And so does the enemy. And he says to you and I, here's my truth. Will you make yourself available to me? All through your life and the seasons of your life, I want you to bear much fruit. And I'll be with you. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'm so grateful, as I'm sure many of you are, of the transforming power of new life in Jesus Christ. It's real. It's true. And it lasts forever.